Explained Live, a series of online explanatory conversations with domain experts and authorities on specific subjects. I am Monujit Majumdar, editor for Explanatory Journalism at the Indian Express. Today, we are discussing India as a space power, a status that the country has laid legitimate claim to following a string of brilliant successes over the last one year. The crowning achievement, of course, was the Chandrayaan-3 moon landing and recently the placement of the Aditya Observatory at the L1 point of the Earth-1 system, uh, Earth-Sun system. Now, there's a lot more on the way. Missions to Mars and Venus, more missions to the moon and human spaceflight missions. Also a bigger and a very significant role for the private space industry. But there are also some questions, including whether space exploration is the right priority for India and whether it will really benefit the country and its common citizens. To discuss the many aspects of India's undoubtedly heady space ambitions we have with us here this evening, Dr. Shomok Raichodhri, one of India's leading astrophysicists. Dr. Raichodhri is a former director of the Pune-based Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, Ayuka, and currently the Vice-Chancellor of Ashoka University. Dr. Raichodhri, welcome. Thank you for your time. We are very honored to have you on our platform. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Speaking to Dr. Raichodhri will be my colleague, science editor Amitabh Sina. Amitabh, you have covered India's space program and missions for years, and you are a bit of an expert yourself. Uh, do read all of Amitabh's wonderful reporting, analysis, and explainers in our paper on our website, www.indianexpress.com, and on the Indian Express YouTube channel. Today's Explained event is brought to you by our partner, Plutus IS. My thanks to our partner. Thank you all for joining. Welcome once again, Amitabh. Thank you, Manajit. Uh, and... Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Dr. H. Audrey, for uh, joining us, for taking the time out to talk to our readers, to uh, our audience. Uh, we'll get into the conversation uh, right away. Uh, I mean, space has uh, always uh, excited people. Uh, you know, much before, you know, the achievements of last year, uh, space is something that has always been celebrated and uh, people have been very, very excited. Uh, but last year has been, uh, as Manojit also said, there have been uh, some of the things that we were keenly awaiting for a long time uh, and also uh, very important milestones which really fired the imagination, especially of the students and the youth. So to start with, uh, you know, I would like you to, you know, uh, give us a sort of an idea of uh, where India's space program currently is, uh, you know, India's space capabilities, where do you place them uh, as compared to the capabilities of other major spacefaring nations? Uh, what are we particularly good at? What, what are we, uh, you know, very, very good at? And what are the things that we still need to work on? We need to build our cap capabilities going forward. That's a, a, a good question, but a very uh, maybe a, a lot of things to say. Um, <clears throat> India is, uh, of course, uh, on the front page um, last year for many very successful and innovative missions. And uh, if you look at the history of India's uh, uh, space uh, uh, activities, um, India's always been behind um, the USA and the previous USSR and now uh, the reconfirmed, uh, re uh, uh, configured uh, Roscosmos and Russian um, space agencies, uh, and in, in terms of their capabilities, um, and of course now in the global uh, scenario, we have China and Japan, uh, who have a very significant uh, space ambitions and capabilities. So I would say that India, together with China and Japan, are kind of the same level, because you can't really assess somebody's space capabilities. Um, yep. Um, you know, you have to base uh, it on the various things they do. Uh, but right. of course, the, the American and the Russian um, capabilities are, are far ahead. And that's because of the experience. That's because of their early investment in uh, this uh, in the space uh, sector 
mostly i would say because of defense considerations because during the cold war both nations put a lot into um the space activities so that they could um they could gain a lot of uh, uh you know um advantage over each other uh, during during that period because that was very important right so but but apart from that even during the last 50 years or so um the way india has uh, participated in various space missions india has been a leader in some things from the straight from from the very beginning um india has had a uh, very interesting early successes in scientific missions india has done remote sensing and weather um, um you know uh, uh, kind of monitoring um f- uh, taking images from space of cloud patterns and weather patterns that kind of activities um from the very uh, very early on and uh, the remote sensing activities of indian uh, satellites have been um quite at the forefront of uh, its early activities and uh, even uh, recently india can be considered a leader in um in uh, in in the remote sensing sector and this comes from a basic need um, that the country has had not just from the defense consideration but from other things as well for example to support our uh, very fast growing agricultural um uh, mechanization we needed help from remote sensing and also communications right and so that is one of the one of the places india has developed quite a bit and there was a point where um just because india's uh, um remote uh, imaging was so good that it actually played a very important role in the global market of uh, of supplying images to media tv channels and things like that from indian satellites so india does does this very well uh, india uh, for a long time and of course as you know at the current status i mean the reason india has come into so much um in the news recently and because india has developed a very very impressive launch vehicle we can launch really um you know payloads up to um almost 6 7 tons to low earth orbit now the um the claim is it can go up to even 8 tons that is amazing because a few years ago that would have been unthinkable uh um, that just means that india's launch capability is sought after by many many other nations including the more developed nations who can't really you don't have launch vehicles that can launch everything that they want to so that's one thing secondly um uh, india's amazing uh, scientific and technological base supports a lot of growth we have a lot of young people coming into this uh, the sector we have a lot of technological know-how we have the the human resources is amazing and so and you know if you look abroad you know you look at the us there will be lots and lots of indian scientists working there too for the space agencies mm-hmm. so within india there is a, a very very interesting base of engineers and and by opening up um to the private sector india is just making sure that we can move ahead in innovative technology india's scientific base uh, which actually can benefit from india's forays into space is also very very important and that actually is lead uh, leading into um leading the indian space program into areas where many other countries have not been so you you soon see and you're already seeing a lot of very innovative space missions which are pretty unique india is leading the world in that so it's not just following what the us and russia have done before and then finally the thing that you um that you hear a lot in india can do a lot of things cheaper than many anybody else right and yeah. and we can talk about that but i mean i think cost effectiveness is a big big thing now one of the things you asked is what can india do better i think india needs to because in the in the in the on the horizon we have um uh, ambitions of uh, building a space station um human space missions things like that so india needs to build uh, a shuttle and and so we need uh, reusable vehicles we need higher launch vehicles of course if one needs to go into human missions one needs to so that kind of stuff but more importantly um what india needs to do is to involve the, the private sector the larger private sector uh, within the country um in 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 these space missions otherwise i mean the ambitions are always going to be rather limited yep uh so people uh, you know 
often talk about the three stage evolution of isro so far and you know something of uh, that was implicit in your uh, response as well we started out with uh, you know societal sort of applications and then uh, remote sensing earth observation came at the first stage then it was followed by a lot of commercial launches because because we had built up our launch uh, capabilities and we were doing quite well and we were launching lots of satellites across the world and now comes the third part the third stage of the evolution wherein we are uh, you know getting uh, lots of science missions uh, which are focused mainly on science and research and planetary exploration now i don't know whether this uh, three stage evolution uh, was intended the way it is or uh, it was forced by circumstances uh, probably uh, no both both of these things work but does is the is there a definitive with the chandrayaan program not just chandrayaan 3 moon landing but uh, even chandrayaan 1 in 2008 did we make a very definitive turn towards science exploration uh, beginning with that mission yeah that's a that's a very interesting perspective now i think uh, you know nothing is planned on a 50 year basis uh, yeah. in terms of this kind of evolution because uh, in the 1970s uh, you know it was hard to know where we would go i mean if you think of how much technology itself that yeah. technology of your phone or of your computer has evolved in the last 50 years it is very hard to imagine that somebody in 1970 said this is where we'll be in 50 years time so um clearly it evolves according to need but it, it evolves also according to competition because i don't think in the 1970s people thought that the private sector would play a very important role in uh, international space um the global space in, uh, um industry so so things have evolved quite a bit now Uh, whether science would have come in or not is an interesting question i think it came in because in the 1990s dr kasturi rangan when he became the um, the space chief the secretary of isro he was the first astrophysicist to become the secretary of isro and then he actually because of his background he very uh, emphatically said we need scientific missions because we need to bring the scientists into our ideation in into our our con- concept of where we will go and the way to do that is that we have a fantastic scientific base in our universities and and in institutes and if we can bring them in and get them interested in our activities then we can gain a lot that actually has happened now so i'm 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 saying in 25 30 years that yep. long term vision is you can see that come to fruition and this is where chandrayaan and and aditya and one come from and 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 so this is because the scientists are now saying okay we'll build things for isro but let's see what isro does and and then somebody like me i've never worked for isro but i've always been um, at a university or institute outside working on projects to do with isro and and so we 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 get very intimately involved in every stage of these activities and and then um and then one one gets to these things so that 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 just makes the circle wider and wider and wider i mean when you say it's in three stages it does not mean when you go to stage 3 you abandon stage 1 and 2 like rockets yeah. it means that you you include the stage 1 and you you grow stage 1 stage 1 keeps going stage 2 keeps going and stage 3 and so while isro is doing these scientific projects now which are hogging the limelight it does not mean it has abandoned the other things yeah. right and and this the the growth in the remote sensing imaging capabilities now in the infrared now in uh, various wave bands multi spectral imaging um is not highlighted much also what is not highlighted is the great role isro satellites play in uh, in disaster management prediction of disasters floods yeah. cyclones and and it gives us uh, time to move people around and things like that all that is recent and has saved thousands if not uh, you know hundreds of thousands of lives so this is i mean uh, the societal part of it is very important the other thing we haven't talked about is india's foray into communication and we can talk about that later yeah, yeah. i mean we all have phones in our pockets and 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 so um, those communication uh, you know devices use satellites in various ways and of course a lot of them use commercial satellites that are not owned by india mm-hmm. but going forward 
that will be one of the very important considerations because we are going to be connected with each other globally in the future through space uh, instruments in space, right? So it is very important strategically. So India is moving in that direction. So India is not just moving forward in scientific um, uh, technology um, uh, demonstrations or scientific experiments. It's moving forward in quite a lot of things. Uh, right now, if you look uh, nationwide, there is this whole um, uh, concept, uh, census going on, on on land ownership and demarcating people's areas, you know, I mean, etc. cetera. There, there are drone footage being taken to figure out how much, I mean, it hasn't been done. This kind of, uh, this kind of uh, surveys have not been done. But the best way to, that is being done is from ISRO's very high resolution um, uh, imaging of land. Uh, these roads, uh, and so th this is being used by the government in 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 land reform and and uh, and and setting, you know, uh, the the ownership of farmers' right. Similarly, looking for natural resources, um, we are not just looking for water on the moon. We are looking for yeah. oil in India. Well, yeah. We are looking yeah. for for minerals on Indian yeah. soil, and so and Isro is very good at that. Yeah. So, so we, we, we often forget, forget that because these are things that it has been doing for decades now and they're getting yeah. better and better and better and so much better that many other countries are buying our data, are, yeah. are asking us to do various experiments for them to, um, to, to, uh, to do this kind of uh, uh, work. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting actually because uh, that also sort of uh, answers a lot of questions uh, which are which often come up uh, uh, um, with regard to India's space program, uh, whether a uh, lower middle income country should actually be uh, in have very high ambitions with regard to its space program, and it has to deal with a lot of other very pressing problems at hand. Uh, and and that question comes up repeatedly, and you you have just given some of the uh, reasons why space program needs to be done. It's not just about uh, you know excitement or jingoism or you know uh, you know carrying the flag in your hand, but it also has some very very concrete uh, benefits and things that uh, uh, which which this uh, data from space can do much more efficiently. Uh, than we could have otherwise achieved. Uh, so, I mean, the space program, therefore, uh, does have does does actually contribute contribute to national development, isn't it? Oh, hugely. I mean, I, let's let's think of uh, let's think of uh, things. I mean, I mean, there's so much to talk about here. First of all, you know, you have um, the economic part of it, right? Right. So the economic part of it is that. We're looking for new resources. We're looking for new resources in the solar system. Eventually, you know, people are talking about mining the moon, mining the asteroids and stuff like that. This is not so far as you think. I mean, it's in the future. Uh, a lot of our resources might come from space. And doing that kind of work now, groundwork now, means that we are ahead in the space race. But that's, that's you know, in the future, what, what are we doing now in the, in the economic development? What is happening is, you know, you will you are spending so much money in space. Actually, it's not that much money. If you can think of yeah. the money we spend, so think of Chandrayaan. A lot of people, I mean, I, I know that very reputed media agencies wrote articles when Chandrayaan 3 went up saying, oh, what a waste of money for a country like India who, uh, where there are poor people and things like that. Then yeah. think of the amount of money spent to build and launch Chandrayaan 3. It's like 600 crores, which is one fourth the price of a Boeing aircraft. It is the um, less expensive than a single expensive Bollywood movie. So, um, you know, I mean, people lose perspective when they see large numbers. Now, what is the advantage of that? Advantage is, first of all, all that money was spent in India. So it wasn't paid out. So it went to bolster our own industry and the money went to our own um, technology um, space, right? And so where uh, industry is building uh, components for um, the world in, uh, in, uh, for machinery, not just for space, but for everywhere. We are helping those companies by asking them to build things for the space program and giving them money. So we are helping them. So it, it strengthens our economy. That's one. Now look at the strategic part of it. I'll come to the common, common person in a minute, but look at the strategic part of it. I'm, I'm just saying we are all connected now 
through space, yeah. right? So it, our mobile phone is actually every fraction of a second sending a signal up. We don't realize it. And it, it gets uh, located and, uh, um, and then uh, by, by three satellites, it's, uh, the, it's things are reflected off, um, of something in space and going into your phone. So when I call you, uh, we are involved in satellites, etc. Now, strategically, and this is, I think, one of the, one of the reasons why um, the US and, and the USSR thought that this was a very important um, uh, area. And that is, if, for example, we have a strategic situation in the future where the country that owns the satellites that my phone is using decides not to let me use it, I lose all communication. So it's very important for India to have its own communication system, connecting all India, right? Yeah. My, my GPS is now, you know, uh, uses American satellites. Yeah. And the US can tomorrow say, you know, Indians can't use it. So we are moving into a future where space plays an important role in everybody's, and by everybody, I mean everybody, because everybody, yeah. man in the street has a phone and they're using space technology. So that's that's one very crucial thing that that I think we need uh, we need to not lose um, uh, perspective this perspective that communication is a space based thing now. I mean, you know, a few hundred years ago we we shouted across fields, and then we used wired technology to communicate with each other. As soon as we have gone through this kind of satellite based communication, then when we are talking to somebody in the next room, we are talking through a satellite. Right. And, and then you look at entertainment, you look at everything else, everything is coming through satellites. So that's, that's, that, that we have to preserve it. And so our country having its own, being self-sufficient in communication is very important. And similarly, it's very important to have our disaster management, our agricultural backup, um, and our, um, our resource uh, finding things all within the country so that we don't have to de uh, depend on other countries. If you remember the great story of the the, the supercomputer Param, yeah. when it for weather forecasting, for monsoon forecasting, Indian scientists wanted to do big simulations, and they were denied the biggest supercomputers by the U.S. because there was a a diplomatic tension between them because of the nuclear testing. India decided that India will build its own supercomputer. And, and so Param was built within a few years and we then became self-sufficient and we never have looked backwards. We don't depend on Americans to give us our best computers, right? We can, we can build them. Yeah. Use American components nowadays, but so that, that's that, that. And, and then if you look at, I mean, I, there are, I could go on and on, but I just want to point out a few things about, um, about the basic, um, um, basic, uh, advantages that the common person gets from from space uh, the space missions if you look at what nasa has done so far and how india is is doing basic research in in making sure it it continues the space program there are a lot of collateral things that have come out of space research and we don't realize that i mean of course uh, I, we we're talking about using a phone the phone communication system in the phone, there's a digital camera that was built for space missions. Um, the Velcro was, was invented for space suits. Memory foam came from a space research. You can uh, you know, think of, um, um, you know, ear implants came from, um, came from uh, space research. I mean, there are many, many, many things that I can, I can, I can talk about, which came as a collateral yeah. of thinking how our, our, um, Astronauts are going to work in a in an environment which is very very tough, and we now use it in a, in very common in very common situations. So, as India goes more and more into developing, remember, I mean, till now, um, a lot of innovation in space technology has slowly grown in India, right? I mean, in, in the at the beginning, we've had help from the Russians, help from the Americans, in in building a lot of stuff, but now India is building its own. Uh, innovative things in in uh, in in building payloads as well as building launch vehicles, and and so Indian industry has been involved, and in this um, involvement in building a frugal way of doing things, uh, India has to innovate, 
And as we innovate things, it just means we are pushing the boundaries and there will be collateral discoveries. So Indian technology goes forward. So uh, what should be uh, this vision for space in the next 20, 30 years? I mean, we are now, uh, we call ourselves to be in the Amrit Kal, and we are planning for becoming a developed country uh, by 2047. So uh, what should be India's space sector? What, what, what would India's, uh, uh, what would the space sector be in a developed India in 2047, what should it be? Um, again, I mean, I, I think I think uh, we can we can um, think about how we want to go. Um, technology is moving so fast that doing a 50-year or 25-year projection might not always be accurate. If you think about what space technology you know was 25 years ago, very few people would have predicted some of the things that we have now. But I think, I mean, I can, I can lay down the, some of the general principles. I mean, I think India is moving towards establishing um, its, um, its stamp on certain things, right? India has to be leaders in certain sectors. That is very, very important. Important for uh, our national pride, but all, and important for um, inspiration for uh, the younger generation, but also important for the following reason, that is, if you look at the international space industry, it is suddenly ballooned to close to a, uh, to a trillion dollar industry. It's almost there. It's an $800 billion industry right now. And India is among the top five space enabled countries. And yet India has a few percent, less than 5% of the, the share of the global space industry. So just for, for the economic part of it, going forward, we are looking at India's economic growth, India being a, a superpower in many ways, uh, India's academic growth, India's industrial growth, India's technological growth. India cannot say that it is a superpower technologically and educationally if it doesn't become a major player in the international space industry. Yeah. So that is one of the future um, ways to go, to make sure that in the international, the, the international space industry becomes so big because it has in the US and then in Europe and, and now in Japan opened up to the private sector. And there are so many private players. NASA is no longer the be biggest player in, uh, in, in the space sector in the US. So private players have come into the business and, and then they are going in all directions. And so one of the things India has to do is to actually, I, I believe, and I'm not sure India will do it, but I believe that what India has to do is to also set the standards of moving forward in the space industry, because we need to be very responsible and show ways of doing things responsibly. Right now, globally, uh, the launching satellites uh, has become so easy that um, a lot of companies, a lot of nations are getting into the business. And this just means that we are littering space and the space around us has become more and more prone to debris all over the place, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think there is very little regulation as to how things are done and who does things. And I think it is very important for India as it grows into the space industry to look at doing things responsibly and, and, and making sure we set the standard, but also very firmly showing that there are certain things we do better than others. We're already doing this in the scientific sector. We've already launched several scientific um, uh, missions that are unique, that are uh, doing much better than other countries. Um, and, and similarly, uh, because we know where we want to go, um, we would certainly try to build things up in a, in a very responsible manner. And I already alluded to another thing that we want to do. We have to build our own communication system. We have to build our own GPS system and make sure that we are self-sufficient in that. Then comes, there are certain things that our India needs very in a, in a unique way. Uh, and that is, um, there, the um, India has uh, weather situations and climate change um, related situations that are pretty unique to India. India is a huge coastal area, uh, which is vulnerable to um, climate change and also to changing in uh, weather uh, patterns, large scale weather patterns causing disaster. So this is one of the areas India has to really um, 
move into with the application of very advanced AI technologies so that, um, so that uh, you know, the, the, the people who inhabit the coastal areas and, and vulnerable areas and also, you know, river flooding in, in the mountainous areas and things like that can benefit from it. So I, th- I think I can see India grow, going into um, socially motivated and strategically motivated um, areas uh, in, a, in, the, in the next, uh, in, in the rest of the Amritkal. I think uh, I, I, you, we, we, will, um, we will concentrate on these. I also know that India will try to, um, uh, will uh, push the boundaries of technology. And one of the yep. reasons for the human space mission Gaganyan is to, is to do that. Yep. Yep. There are certain amazing technologies that can be tested once we, you know, go to the, the, this whole thing about, about humans in space. Uh, similarly, through some of these ambitious scientific missions, we are um, also, you know, testing the boundaries. And that is also very important because it's always important to show to the young people. And remember, young, India's young people is going to be the largest bunch of young people in the world yeah. for time to come, decades to come. And, uh, and uh, it is very important that uh, it inspires, India's space program inspires young people. And young people continue to be, um, you know, continue to cheer for it. Not just that, but <clears throat> come into the, uh, the the sector of of STEM education and, and 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 space technology and things like that, and so it has to be attractive. The things that we do, we can't be seen to do really boring stuff. Yeah. So that, uh, and 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 this is why you know I mean uh, when Chandrayaan three goes up um, and lands, um, you see kids yeah. in the street cheering. Um, you know, like they won a cricket match. So yeah. this is this is the kind of uh, um, impact I think the India Space Program needs to have with every, you know, these high profile missions. So um, I, I, I I see the growth in these areas, but of course, as you know, I mean, I, it, it all uh, you know comes from competitiveness and uh, situations. I mean, there might be situations where um, the country might feel that uh, space uh, the space program needs to rise up to a certain crisis that has happened and and yeah. we can build things for it yeah so the, the battle with the cricket is quite interesting actually and it did feel like that in fact on on that day and i i'm sure as uh, uh, ISRO has announced several, already announced several high-profile missions, the follow-up missions uh, to Chandrayaan, you know, having a, a space station of its own, also getting humans on the moon uh, at some point uh, in time. Uh, so, you know, we, we'll have those kind of, uh, you know, moments wherein almost the entire country, you know, uh, gets interested in what ISRO is doing. Also. You know, where do you see and what kind of role do you see the private sector playing here? What What is the role of private sector? Should it be competing with ISRO, doing the same kind of things? Or should it be more uh, uh, doing, uh, getting into a complementary job uh, vis-a-vis ISRO? I think the answer is mixed. It's not a straightforward answer. Right. Uh, that's because, you know, I mean, uh, why did... NASA, who's our kind of predecessor in this business, um, want to open up. And NASA is much bigger than ISRO yeah. when it opened up. And NASA had always a, a very strong backup scientific program of scientists and engineers who worked for NASA to build bigger missions. And, um, and, 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 um, and it was, over the country, it was a much bigger, bigger enterprise. Um, decided to open up partly because we realized that if the ambition is big enough, then one cannot really contain everything in a federal structure. It's after all a government organization. And within a government organization, there are certain restrictions, there's certain bureaucracy, and also there's certain lack of competitiveness. And I think the competitiveness in the end makes things better. The competitive helps in the market. But on the other hand, I think complementarity is a very important thing because there are things that a government organization cannot do or do well that the private industry does. In India, that's happened now in a spectacular way. I mean, I, again, ISRO scientists and ISRO tech, uh, engineers are all government servants. And, and so they are um, in, in their pay structure, in their, um, 
in their structure of the, the, the way they do things, they procure things, they buy things from the open market and they build things, have to follow strict government rules and protocols, which, uh, which actually is not so easy to navigate if you want to do something in a hurry, if you want to do something very, very innovative. And, uh, and sometimes you want to do research that is so far-fetched that it's, it's difficult to justify. So that is where the private sector comes in. And uh, in some cases, even uh, private players uh, in other countries also may come in where you can find some expertise that, that would complement it. So I think complementarity is where I think things will settle in the end, where ISRO will do its own thing that it does better. And yep. um, the, pri sector, the private sector around it will do other things. I think it's absolutely essential. There is no way a government entity however big, could sustain the kinds of things that we are talking about. I mean, yeah. why, are, why are we talking? We're talking about this because we are saying that the future, a lot of essential human activities will be based on things in space, like communication, right. like, um, like remote sensing. And so mm -hmm. there, just because the volume of work increases, the volume of um, the requirement of technology increases, the volume of um, the safety protocols also increases. I mean, you have to keep the satellites safe. And so we have to know how the sun is behaving. And that's why I did the L1. We have to keep those satellites safe. So we need to make sure we know where the space debris are so that they don't, they don't get fried, stuff like that. And so then the ancillary jobs also increase. And so you can't do this with a, with a single federal organization, which has its own bureaucracy. So, um, but another thing that was holding back ISRO, remember ISRO was not like NASA in that ISRO never had its own science base. With ISRO, like NASA had the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the Goddard Space Flight Laboratory on both coasts, which was just scientists, astrophysicists, engineers, you know, chemists, biologists who were working for um, building the reasons for the space missions, the payloads, as well as parts of the, the technology. In, ISRO never had that. ISRO had does have smaller institutions like the Physical Research Laboratory and, and the SAC in Ahmedabad and part of its uh, um, organizations in Trivandrum and in Bangalore who built science payloads, but it was nothing with the scale of NASA. So ISTO then realized if you have to bring scientists in, you have to bring in the research institutes and universities in, as well as the private players who will add in to the, um, to, the, to the technology. But that competition between now ISRO's own science enterprise and the scientists working in other institutions and universities will spur ISRO on to do various things. So I think the competition is necessary in the initial phases of opening up, but eventually things will get... Um, equilibrated at a, at a situation where everybody will figure out where they want to be, what they want to do. And we know that ISRO is very good at launch vehicles. And I think ISRO will always be very good at launch vehicles and developing them. And ISRO will, will carry on doing the launching and showing people how to do launching. But the building of the payloads will slowly come out of ISRO and go into the private, not just the private sector, but in the sector of academic institutions, the IITs, the engineering colleges uh, have already started, um, you know, uh, pitching in to building things um, and, um, and the universities and research institutes are building payloads and things like that. So that's where the complementarity will come. Uh, and, and the private enterprise is absolutely essential. I just told you that the, the size yes. of the international space market now, uh, there is no way you can be a little player in a government institution sitting, uh, you know, doing government work anymore. Yeah. So uh, I, I have a complimentary question uh, that just uh, takes off from what he was saying. And this is uh, from uh, Professor Krishnendu Sena from IIT Bombay. And, and then I'll uh, open it up for, uh, you know, audience questions. So uh, Professor Sena asks now, how can the recent achievements of ISRO be used to catalyze a much wider revolution in science and engineering in the country, specifically in the area of higher education and research, where there is still a dearth of skilled manpower. It's absolutely, you know, what I would um, 
I would concentrate on. I mean, it's very, very high priority. And then thank you very much for asking this or making this comment. First of all, you know, I mean, think of science and technology. I mean, who is a scientist? A young kid going to school, growing up in school, why would they want to do science and engineering? They would want to go do to engineering because their parents are pushing them to get into the IITs or whatever, sit okay. for the JE program, and that kind of stuff. Not because they want to do research in engineering or science, yeah. but because they want to get a job by going through a prestigious engineering college and, and then study for that kind of stuff. That is not the kind of career that I'm interested in. I want our kids to get interested in innovation, interested in scientific study, to learn science, to learn engineering and, and you know, be innovative. In order to do that, one needs to go into development entrepreneurship and research, science research, engineering research. You know, even our highest topmost um, uh, engineering colleges have concentrated on uh, educating students, but less much on, on, on a fundamental research. Um, and now look at IIT Bombay, um, yeah. uh, where um, a lot of front-ranging research is now happening. And that's being driven by the... Um, the, the need to, and even in the space sector, the need in space sector to involve people like um, IIT Bombay. Now, how do you bring in these students who think science is hard, mathematics is hard? They think of a scientist as somebody who looks like Professor Calculus with test tubes and, 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 you know, and, and, and lab coats and, um, and old people. I mean, Einstein, Einstein is a, a mad looking person with hair and yeah. stuff like that. That's what a scientist and, and so, you know, that's why the young person wants to be a footballer or a, or a film star or an astronaut, maybe, but not a scientist, not a, not a researcher. It is things like space science, astronomy, certain aspects of biology that, that, that makes science research attractive. It draws in. I mean, this is the spectacle of, of Chandrayaan, uh, you know, being launched landing on the moon, you know, we're talking about doing things, finding water, all that kind of stuff. The, all that stuff is attractive to young people. Why, why is the young person in the street clapping? Because this has happened. Because there's a sense of achievement and a sense of, you know, actually watching something new happen that they can uh, relate to. And so this is, this is far more removed than somebody dreaming to be a, a molecular chemist at a research lab when they're actually, uh, you know, thinking of their career, they don't know what the impact of that person would be. I mean, drug discovery is very important. Yeah. Does a class 10, class 10 student think that they're going to work on drug discovery at, in, at the molecular level, what the challenges are and how attractive that work will be? Somebody needs to show them and very few people have mentors who show them how, how attractive that kind of science can be. Here is something, space research and achievements in space, uh, space, the space sector, that brings home in some, a few pictures and a YouTube broadcast um, the, uh, the attractiveness of, uh, of, of this kind of achievement. And that is how I think, um, uh, the, the, that is what the biggest impact is on the young people of the country. So young people moving through this whole, um, whole system of high school and undergraduate education, if they get motivated to come into various aspects of the kind of uh, projects we are talking about, and they could come from any angle. I mean, if you want to be, um, want to be an astrophysicist, a space scientist, um, you can be an engineer of any kind. You can be a, a, a physicist or a chemist or a biologist or a mathematician or a statistician. You can do all kinds of things. It's not that there's only one kind that becomes a space scientist. And, and so there are many paths to it. And it, one just chooses a way to get there. And so if I know, if I think that I love doing statistics, then I, I can say, okay, I'll do statistics, but I will come in and, and yeah. take part in this whole um, project that the nation is taking up. To, to do this kind of stuff. So, I mean, it's, it just focuses people's attention on the key areas that will, um, that, that will help the country, help the space program, and create amazing science that others will, uh, will celebrate. 
and and this is why i think uh, it it's it's a great draw and i think uh, it's a great uh, you know pr for for yeah. people who are in science so uh i'll i'll bring in our audiences at this point uh they will uh, ask the questions themselves uh, so the first question will come from uh, aditi uh, aditi is from plutus eyes our sponsor uh, for uh, this evening uh, aditi uh, if you're there please go ahead and ask your question I'm not sure. Aditi, are, are you they, there, Aditi? They might be muted. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, I think uh, we'll go on to the next person. We'll, uh, we'll bring Aditi when she comes. Uh, the next question coming from Nishant Singhal. Uh, Nishant, if you are there, you can go ahead. Nishant Singhal. Are there questions in the chat box? We can take a look. Yeah, there there are. Uh, no, I, they have written their questions in there. Yeah, quite a few of them actually. So, uh, okay, let's let, let, the next one. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Uh, who is this? Was it Aditi? No. We can go to the next uh, question. Wait. Okay. Uh, the next question uh, would come from NR Superna. Uh, Superna, are you there? Uh, yes, sir. I'm there very much. Okay. Please go ahead. Uh, my question is, all of what uh, you say is uh, very good, very good stuff. Remote sensing, communication, strategic area, higher education, science, space science. But why send a man to moon after USA who did it 50 years ago? They have not uh, gone any further in that direction. There can be no commercial value, surely, particularly with advanced robotics. Why man on the moon? Thank you very much for asking that question. I think, um, you know, um, this is my, um, my, my aspect of looking at it. I think going for, to send a man on the moon right now is not for the same reason as the U.S. went in the 1960s. In the, during the Cold War, sending a man on the moon was equally uh, apparently meaningless. I mean, I, because it, it came from nowhere. I mean, the space technology was only being tested. And in the race between the US and the USSR, uh, sending a person on the moon became a show off, a show of technology that we can do this. I don't think we gained much by, by you know, in the long run by doing that. But Again, we're talking of a, 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 an exercise which kind of shows that this is the limit of our technology. We can do before anybody else. I think that was, that was a show between them. I don't think it served any long-term purpose other than those amazing inspirational images and stories. And, you know, a kid like me who was, you know, in, in, in primary school at that time was absolutely elated that a man has landed on the moon. And, and so that inspired me a lot. That kind of effect was there. But it didn't serve a long-term purpose, as you are saying. Now, if India does it now, it will not be for the same reason. We are not showing that we need to uh, inspire somebody. I mean, a, a kid is not inspired by a, an Indian landing on the moon as much as we were inspired in 69 when, an, when a person landed on the moon, even though they were not Indian. I don't think so. I don't think that that value is still there. What is there now is that we are looking at it in a long-term space exploration perspective. As I said now, I mean, we, we are getting into an era where we will communicate with each other through space devices and stuff like that, but we also have to go into space exploration and that means exploring the, um, the, the near solar system to begin with in order to find resources, in order to find um, um, various things uh, in, in other plan on other planets and asteroids. So for example, if you want to set up a space station and then you go to the moon, um, uh, people going to the moon, then what will happen is that we will try to see whether we can find minerals on the moon that, um, that, that uh, we have run out on, of, on Earth. 
think of uh, lithium, which we use in batteries. Um, almost every little small batteries that we have use lithium, and we're going to run out of lithium after a while. And we know that the asteroids have a lot of lithium. We might find lithium on the moon. So we're thinking long term. We're not thinking in the next 10, 20 years. We're thinking of 50, 100, 200 years. And then if we have to get resources from elsewhere in the solar system, can we just go there? We need stops. If we want to travel from one city to another, we, we need refueling at a, at a petrol pump. We need the place, the dhaba, where we'll have our breakfast and our lunch. And then, you know, we need to do it in stages. So the space station and the moon will be our initial stages before we go any further in, into the solar system. If we want to go into um, to asteroids, if we want to go into the, the far reaches of the solar system. And in order to do that, we have to build a base on the moon. This is why we are testing the soil there. We're testing the air there to figure out what gases there are. We're trying to test why, whether there's water on the moon. Why, why do we want to know that? One of the reasons is we want to know if we put an establishment there, a petrol pump, if you will, on the moon, then where will the water come from for the people who live there, right? So that kind of stuff, it is, it, it is a very long-term strategy. And the reason India needs to do this now is India needs to be one of the major players. India will be the, it's already the, the most populous nation in the world. And if our resources depend on things that we have to go and bring back from elsewhere in the solar system, we need to establish our footprint, just like we establish our footprint on, on Antarctica. We need to, uh, and, and in the oceans, we need to establish our footprint on the moon and, and in the asteroids. That is, I think, why we are testing this kind of technology. It's not a, just a show-off anymore. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, uh, one, of, one of our uh, people in the audience wasn't there, so, but I'll, I'll ask his question in any case. Uh, and the question from uh, Nishank, if I got his name correct, Nishant Singhal, was that... Uh, how is ISRO able to uh, accomplish its missions at such a low cost uh, compared to other countries? What does it do? Uh, this is something that you had referred in one of your responses earlier as well, and I thought we would. Uh, it's it's better to elaborate on that, and that's something that a lot of people do think about. How how is it that ISRO is able to do it so cheaply? Well, there are two aspects to it. I think it's a very very interesting question. A lot of people wonder how this happens. And they think of the most obvious thing, and that is, um, that is things are cheaper in India and people are cheaper in India. Salaries are lower in India. And so we have lots and lots of um, people working on space missions where, um, <clears throat> where, where uh, you know, for example, in ISRO, it's a government organization. They get government salaries. And, uh, and so if some, something is built in the private sector in the U.S., uh, the people, the engineers, the same engineers doing the same things, would earn a lot more, maybe uh, five to ten times more salary. So, and 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 the 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 um, the components of of things that um, are used in making the launch vehicles and and the fuel and the um, and the and the and the payloads, etc. All um, the comp the parts that are bought in India will be a lot cheaper. So that's one aspect of it, and that's the most obvious answer. But there is another aspect to it, and that is there's been this huge tradition in India of Jugar. And Jugar is a big thing. And Indian scientists and engineers love Jugar. They love doing, solving problems in a cost-effective way. And in a way where we won't compromise on quality, but we do it in a way that um, we don't spend much money. And I've seen so many uh, examples of this uh, in, in solutions to problems that have come up in, uh, in, in our, uh, you know, journey, space journey. So, I mean, Indian, in the, the Indian engineers and, and scientists would come up with solutions that are, that are wonderful. That, that, that's, that also brings down the cost in a big way. Um, you know, one of the things that you've heard in this whole Chandrayaan uh, um, story was how it took 40 days to go to the moon. Whereas other, other uh, missions have taken much shorter. I mean, the Apollo missions from the US, which went straight up, took three or four days. And, and for, to, the whole 40 days thing was because the orbits were designed to 
in a very, very complicated way to save fuel and so bring down the cost, right? And the bring down the cost, so how, how was it done? So here's an example. So what you do is you have to break free of the Earth's gravity. To do that, there is a certain velocity called the escape velocity that you have to attain in order to get, get you know, away from the Earth. And that escape velocity from the Earth, from the surface, is very, very high. And in order to attain that, you have to give it a huge amount of energy, which comes from fuel that is very expensive. So, but if you can actually break free of gravity, the Earth's gravity, from a place that is very far away from the Earth, very high up, then you don't use as much fuel and it's much, much cheaper. So you saw how the Chandrayaan and Mangalyaan and now the Aditya orbits were designed that the, the spacecraft was put in an elliptical orbit and that orbit slowly grew and grew and grew in size. And when it reached a point very far away from Earth and then a rocket fired and it broke free of the Earth's gravity. And when it did so, the escape velocity from that point was very, very low compared to what it would be from the Earth. So that kind of thing compromises the safety of the, of the, of the craft because you're giving it so many days to go into so many orbits. Anything can go wrong. But we're taking that risk because we're making saving money. And secondly, in this orbit design, some of the design also uses the gravity of the Earth and then the Moon to do part of the work that is needed to put them in this orbit. And that is free. You don't need any fuel for that. So these are called the slingshot effect, where you use the Earth's gravity or the, or, or, or the planet's gravity. We've done it in Mangalyan, we've done it in Chandrayaan, and, and, uh, and it's just part of it is free and part of it is, is low cost fuel of a, of a lower volume. This is the kind of jigar that Indian um, uh, you know, missions are very good at. And, and this is what I, a lot of, lot of people around the earth are trying to learn how India is doing it this. I mean, and so there was a lot of skepticism when Chandrayaan, the first one went up saying, you know, how could anybody attain this at this cost? And then slowly all around the world, people started realizing that it's, it's a combination of, of course, frugal way of uh, not paying our scientists enough but also um just the just the innovation that goes into it thank you so the next question is from uh, ananya thakur ananya is a student ananya if you're there so please go ahead um hello i'm an audible yeah please go ahead okay um uh, first of all sir thank you for your insights they were quite helpful and my question is that while India is a top contender with the other organizations and countries, would India ever be able to surpass organizations and major economies like um, USA and NASA? Uh, things that even countries like China have been unable to do. So is that ever possible that even though India is a contender for even, uh, like you said, for GPS, India does have, have NUB, IT and all of that. But Will India ever be able to compete and cross NASA as an US in space? Thank you very much. That's a very, very uh, intelligent question. Very good question. And I think it's, there's no straightforward answer to this. I mean, I, I would, first of all, um, contend that India has never always played second fiddle in, in various, the various programs India has done. You know, look at the past. Even as ISRO operated as a uh, as a government organization with uh, uh, its own government servants uh, and as engineers and, and scientists, India took a very, very leading role in uh, remote sensing and weather sensing and, uh, uh, and weather prediction and that kind of stuff. That's to give an example. I mean, even uh, in, in a few years ago, if you were watching a television uh, in a city in the US and somebody was predicting the weather and showing cloud patterns, cloud maps, there's a high chance that that picture would come from an Indian satellite, right? So um, India had, has not in all spheres played second fiddle. If you think of, India came into the space picture later than uh, the US or USSR, but there are so many activities in space 
and India has played a very leading role in many of them and done better um, than other countries. One good example is in the scientific satellites that have gone up. I mean, think of Astrosat, which was launched in 2015, which is an astronomical satellite. Its ultraviolet telescope is the best in the world. It has done much better than the, the best NASA satellite, uh, which is uh, the, the NASA UV telescope, Galax. Um, Aditya L1, which is now launched, has just reached the first Lagrangian point, is going to produce the best pictures of the sun compared to the European or uh, NASA missions to do the same thing. So we are, we, we can lead uh, the field uh, and, and this is what's happening now. And this is why I'm here. This is why we're discussing this because India is on, uh, in, in, we are at a turning point where if we can expand the Indian space industry the way we are talking about by bringing in the private players. I mean, we, we haven't been competitive enough because India hasn't brought in the private sector early enough. Now, not just the private players, but, the, but even the academic sector of scientists like us coming into the picture means that the, we, we have a much, much larger base of dealing with particular problems. And I don't think in the near future, India is going to be the global leader in space. As I said, India you know, plays a, a less than a 5% role in the space market uh, in, in terms of the projects India does right now. But if India picks areas in which it can excel very fast, very soon, then we are going to show already in certain areas that I've already talked about, we have shown that we are leading the world. We can lead the world and slowly expand into other areas. And that is, I think, uh, the, the positive picture I can give you. And I think, I think there is a lot of possibility that India can, can, can become one of the major the space leaders in many areas. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from uh, Amartya Sinha. Uh, Amartya, if you are there, please go ahead. Hello. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Okay, sir. I have a question regarding, I'm an aerospace journalist based in Delhi. So, uh, India is going to carry out the first Gaganyan flight in 2025, right? That's for sure. It's on course. But what about the extravehicular activity? What about the spacewalks? Why is it not uh, made up, you know, being made a first, uh, the part of the first flight itself, Gaganyan? And how many Gaganyan it, uh, flights it can take to, uh, you know, execute an EVA, extravehicular activity spacewalk? The second thing is regarding, you know, the semi cryogenic engine technology. We have been working on it for quite a long, few years, but we have not seen any test launches as of now, right? So how will this new generation technology, this semi cryogenic SC200 engine, uh, reduce India's dependence on foreign rockets as far as launching of heavier communication satellites is concerned? Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. So first of all, uh, talking about Gaganyan, I mean, I, I think uh, the first um, part of uh, the human space mission will be launched soon. It doesn't mean Gaganyan is going to be launched now. I think uh, the whole point is um, testing certain modules that um, will um, make it possible for a human to be placed in an orbit in a safe manner is going to be done in a phased manner, right? Slowly, because there are various things that one of the most important things is to make sure that the, um, the spacecraft is safe for the human that is in there. And space uh, safe in two ways. One is that the, the human who's inside the spacecraft should not feel any life-threatening um, uh, difficulties while in orbit. But more importantly, the most important, the most important part of the, of, the, of the launch is the, the launch itself and the time it takes to get free of the atmosphere. And if, for example, the the spacecraft burns up like it has in several spectacular cases, whether, um, whether the, the person inside the spacecraft can eject themselves or uh, have, a, have a policy of, of, have a way of actually falling to the ocean and, and still be safe. That kind of things um, are being worked out and, uh, and those will play a very important role in finally getting the human to space. Right. So in, as in anything, you know, you, you do things in baby steps. 
Other countries have done extravehicular walks, spacewalks. And so we would just start with spacewalks. It's like you haven't learned your saregama yet. You're, you're, you're singing classical music, right? You shouldn't do that. You can't start learning classical music without learning the notes first. So we have to do in steps. And India cannot learn this from the experience of other, other, other nations and other, other companies. They have to go through the whole process themselves. Because it is led by the Gaganyan project. We are getting help from other countries, but we are um, doing most of the work ourselves. And it's not just ISRO doing this, of course, it's a huge amount of involvement of the Indian Air Force in it. And, and uh, India's entire defense industry is, is playing a role in, in Gaganyan. So um, this is a big, um, a big achievement when, when it happens. And it will happen. Now, then it's, it's all connected because the human um, spacecraft, um, the space mission, is not geared towards landing somebody on the moon. That's not the main important thing. The main important thing is the next step, once we can place a human in orbit, we will then have them you know, essentially build the space station. So the space station to be assembled, um, you know, it was done by the U.S., with its shuttle, we don't have a shuttle, right? And so uh, to figure out how a space station can go in, in orbit, uh, one needs to do it in, in, in certain stages and it will require human involvement, right? So that is why I think the space station program has a timeline of, I mean, the target that has been given in the mid thirties, 35, 36, something like that. And in order to get there, we will build up certain experiments to see how certain parts of the space station can be, um, can be put in orbit and whether humans can be involved in, uh, in, 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 in actually helping to, to put the space station together. So these, these two are connected. And absolutely, the spacewalks, et cetera, will happen as technology um, you know, um, demonstration once we get a human first to safely to space and back, that's most important, right? And, and, and so I think all of this will happen in stages. Uh, coming to your um, cryogenic engine um, um, uh, issue. Yes, I mean, I think uh, the, the, the difference uh, the cryogenic um, engine makes, that the launch vehicle makes, is, uh, is to have a launch vehicle that's capable of much bigger payloads then you can um, can master now. As I said, we can now do payloads. The Chandrayaan was was about four tons, and uh, and which was you know not very big, and it had quite a lot of payloads on there. But once you get into uh, things that actually are carrying a, a space station or, a, or 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 humans, then you need much bigger um, um, you know um, launch vehicles that can launch much bigger payloads. And for that, one needs um, to get into cryogenic engines. Um, I think um, one of the advantages of the new plan of um, diversifying ISRO's activities and bringing in the private sector actually is as an intention. And one of the intentions is to have ISRO concentrate on things they do well, they do better. And one of them, I think, is the development of the launch vehicle and to go to launch vehicles that can tackle bigger and bigger payloads and to concentrate, have their engineers concentrate on that and not get distracted by various things that smaller players can do or even larger private sector players can do is a very good strategy. And the strategy is then, you know, because this, this development of the next big engine, the next cryogenic engine, the next normal engine, taking so long, partly because of the lack of resources, lack of human resources. And if he can put together um, its resources in developing certain things that are high priority, and then let the, um, the rest of the industry handle the, um, uh, the, the, the other aspects, I think is going to help. And so I, I'm very hopeful that all this will come together because all, they all need each other. You know, I mean, human space flight needs stronger launch vehicles. The space station needs both of these two. 
and they have to all come together to make the space station happen in in 10 years thank you uh, our next uh, person to ask the question is uh, mahfuz ahmed siddiqui uh, please go ahead if you are there mahfuz sir uh, uh, yeah hi <clears throat> Good evening to everyone. Uh, thank you very much for allowing us to be a part of this elite panel, and especially thank you, Dr. Samak, uh, for providing us uh, with such a wonderful of information. Uh, my question is not uh, into the technicalities we have gone through so far. I am uh, concerned about the inclusion of space education into the national education policy. But uh, as we all know and understand it better, that the learning aid or the tools for the space education is too expensive. So, uh, are we already uh, in a mindset that where we have limited a certain class? Okay, that this will go <laughs> for this particular, uh, you know, uh, sector. That means a large group of uh, uh, the students or the aspirants who even want to know more about it, that they do not have any access to this. So. Uh, do we have any such plannings? Because only inclusion of this space education will not suffice. I hope uh, you can enlighten me more on this. So to become a master or a champion in this industry, inshallah, I also wish that we 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 have already reached on uh, multiple. Uh, no, no, I understand. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for uh, thanks for asking yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. I I, okay. I I hope I've got got the gist of your question. I, you're asking essentially, um, what is the the status of uh, education related to the the space development we are talking about and and the ingredients of the you know of, of students learning the ingredients of what goes into development in space in order for us to become space leaders yeah so uh, one of the things that i already told told you about is that you don't need to become a space scientist um to become a space scientist that is that means that you don't need to qualify as a, exclusively as a scientist from the very beginning of education. Because to be a space scientist <clears throat> and, and to take part in all the developments we are talking about um, in, in the economic sector, in the social sector, strategic sector, all these things that we are talking about, one needs to be first, either have good STEM education and secondly, have um, you know education that is open enough that encourages people to think innovatively and in a, in, a, in a mindset of solving problems and doing research, right? So science education, engineering education is important. So what you do is you go into university um, with an aspiration of doing a very rigorous science degree or an engineering degree. All science and engineering degrees contribute to space missions, right? I'm saying we have, if you just go and take a survey of people who work in ISRO on these, these projects, you will find that there are mechanical engineers, chemical engineers, um, computer scientists, uh, and people who've studied robotics, people who've studied electronics, electrical engineers, everybody. And you have people who come from a very strong background in physics, chemistry, biology, uh, and even things like economics and social sciences. So, I mean, a lot of people contribute to these missions um, because they have a strong degree in science and engineering. That is important. But more importantly, I mean, a lot of the engineering colleges or science colleges will teach you the subject in a way which is not going to be useful to you because you won't learn how to solve problems. You don't learn how to, um, how to ask the right questions. And that is very important. That's why your question is very important. In order for us to become leaders in any any field, scientific field or technological field like space research, one needs to make sure that the education that we give to our young people, you know, asks, you know, in, encourages asking questions. And even in our top educational institutions, I think nowadays, you don't get um, that kind of emphasis on, there's, there's the emphasis on getting marks and passing exams, passing entrance exams to get into these colleges um, one says that getting into an engineering college as a student is harder than getting into an engineering college as a professor because, you know, it's just passing exams. Now, you've passed an exam and got into a, a very famous engineering college. Does that mean that you're becoming a space scientist? I'm not saying you have to get into space engineering degree. 
You can be a mechanical engineer, but then be a fantastic space scientist. But that mechanical engineering degree should teach you how to think, how to solve problems, and how to think what the next problem will be. And this is why values like critical thinking and problem solving has to become part of STEM education. And this is one of the, that's why I, I am teaching at Ashoka University now as a scientist, because one of the things that one wants to do is to bring together critical thinking, liberal arts style education, and scientific thinking together. And I think this kind of ethos of, uh, of liberal arts, of, of, of actually trying to solve problems, having an education which teaches people to think um, is, is important. And this is how we'll make the next generation of scientists and engineers. So I'm, I'm very tempted to actually pick up uh, a question that landed in the chat box uh, some time ago, uh, which is a related question. I don't know whether you have uh, given a serious thought to it, but uh, the uh, 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 one of the people, Ganeshan, uh, you know, he asks, uh, what will be the role of and is there a role for social scientists and liberal arts scholars in space research? Now, you head an institution which is started essentially as a liberal arts uh, university, uh, probably you would have given a thought to it. No, no, absolutely. And I, I think I, 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 this is why I alluded to the value of liberal arts education. And liberal arts doesn't mean liberal or arts. I mean, liberal arts means to think, uh, of, to teach people to think, critically think, and then ask the right questions rather than, um, you know, answer questions given by others. So this is, so in our university, for example, no matter what people major in, they can major in uh, economics or history or physics, they have to undergo a bunch of courses. Everybody has to undergo a bunch of courses that are called critical thinking, critical reading, great books, um, the history of the country, history and culture, has to learn how to appreciate art and language, they have to learn quantitative skills. They have to learn principles of science. Everybody does it. And then they go on to do other things. This basic way of thinking is the, is the crux of liberal arts education. And if you look in, in the West, in, in the US, you see some of the greatest universities are based on this kind of education. Harvard, Yale, uh, the famous uh, Ivy League universities were all liberal arts institutions because this is the students going through there, no matter where they major, they have to learn these values first. And we, we feel that what has happened is that we make students specialists very early on. And as a result, they learn to, uh, to actually imbibe knowledge and not to apply them because they don't know how to, how to apply that knowledge. And so this is where I think it's very important to, for people who are doing technology to come into contact with social scientists. This is what we are in our, our university, for example, we have not only bring students from different disciplines together in these classes, and I, as an astronomer and space scientist, I am teaching classes on space science to hundreds of students in a class where they are actually doing their honors in history and English and political science and also physics, chemistry, mathematics, and biology. So all of them come together. They, 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 they talk about um, the issues and then they learn from each other. Now, going forward, I already told you that we are getting dominated by um, space-related um, lifestyles, right? So our lifestyle items will, will all depend on space. Then who's worrying about the ethics of it all? How ethical behavior? Who will teach us about ethical behavior? The philosophers will. The people who work on, I mean, you already are looking at the ethics of AI and philosophers and, and computer scientists and economists are talking to each other. Similarly, who's going to work out the economics of of, of this going forward, how all of this activity goes into industry and how industry goes to ben benefit from this. In fact, in our entrepreneurship department, we are now te teaching uh, a course on frugal entrepreneurship. And, and so, um, and, and, and this is, uh, you know, they're all, all of these students are watching now. I mean, in, 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 and, so, uh, and, and so that is the whole point. The point is that we are going to um, uh, bring together the different disciplines and thus enrich uh, um, the, the way people um, look at education. And I think a very basic way of, uh, there are two aspects of, of this development of our fascination with space is bringing into the picture. One is the, the inspiration that these events, ISRO's successes are giving the high school students and the young people of the country. 
but also it is bringing to our to the forefront the the question of how what is the kind of education that we want to give these young people now this young person who is fascinated by the success of easter wants to come and become a space scientist what does it what do they do they have to be given the right kind of education and i think the right kind of education in this particular way is to have a, an education a stem education which has to have some level of critical thinking in humanities and social sciences imbibed into it so that people can think of this whole enterprise in a holistic way and uh, and that's how we'll integrate this into society we're looking we're talking about use of space for societal good and what good is it to society if the space scientist does not think about society thank you uh, we still have a few questions from the audience i would request each one of you to uh, keep your questions short and direct uh, in the interest of time the next question uh, is from medini barua uh, medini if you are there please go ahead hello uh, am i audible yeah please. yeah yeah please go ahead firstly thank you for inviting me to such a great audience panel thank you sir uh, and uh, my question was that uh, like i actually wanted to know why whether the chandrayaan landing on the moon poles was much tougher prospect than landing near the equator yes absolutely right and and i mean this has been highlighted and i'll tell you why um um actually orbit wise it's not a, a difficult thing but it so happens that on the moon there are two difficulties and this is why initially all the landings that have happened in the in the 60s 70s etc were happening uh, near the equator one is that moon's terrain is uh, is such that near the poles um, there are much deeper craters it so happens and there's a reason for that much deeper craters and much higher hills so the terrain is much more rugged towards the the poles than towards the equator and that is probably because a lot of the collisions that have happened of minor bodies with the moon have uh, have been have been near the equator and so things have weathered much better and become smoother the second thing is that near the um uh, the pole the temp it's very far away from the lit area of the moon the lit area of the moon is near the equator near the pole is towards the dark side of the moon and that means up, but there is no dark side of the moon but i mean it is it is towards away from the illumination and that's why it's the dark side and, and so the temperatures can go down to minus 200 degrees it's very very cold and this is why why the indian probe went to look for ice there because you can find solid ice uh, you know in in places where the temperature is 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 so so low and it it can be shielded with these high hills so the terrain is bad and the temperature is horrible so why would i want to land there and the reason we're trying to land there is because the other parts are much better um surveyed now and so india's missions chose to go into an area that's very very hard to to manage but the reason the poles are are difficult because it's because of this it's very bad terrain to land and you saw what happened to our first landing attempt and it was because we managed to land just at a place which is on the edge of a crater and the thing landed and toppled down and uh, and so this time an extra care was uh, was given to make sure it didn't land in a place which was not level and and so that that does the, does make a polar landing much more difficult but poles are much more interesting because they're unexplored and it is um it is actually more likely to find traces of water and things like that near the poles right uh, the next question is uh, from mr anoy sarkar uh, sir if you're there please go ahead Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. please go ahead. Uh, Dr. Rai Choudhury, Mr. Sinha, and Mr. Majumdar, thank you so much uh, for such an informative session, and thanks to Space Tech that we are able to hear and see each other from the comfort of our homes. Uh, sir, uh, my question is uh, pertaining to MSMEs. What do you feel is the role MSMEs have to play in the space sector? Uh, considering that this is a very niche uh, area. are not msmes constrained by lesser than favorable quantity of skilled labor especially in the unorganized sector thank you you see i mean i no not at all because you know i mean uh, um 
MSMEs are small enterprises where um, they they often concentrate on building very um, specialized things, very small things, very specific things. I mean, the in the space industry, there is need for very large entities that can do a lot of things together to bring the spacecraft and payload together, like ISRO has done by by actually integrating a spacecraft and building all different parts of it in its different um, different uh, um, uh, wings. But um, but in this kind of a, uh, an, uh, an era where we are going to make a lot of these uh, uh, space projects, uh, you will find that there are um, there are components of various parts of the spacecraft, the payload, the the launch mechanism. Um, all of these things will have um, quite a lot of different small things that are in common that are very specific. And what I think the MSMEs can do is um, is be specialists in building those things. So then you would find that when there's a big company or even ISRO or even a large government organization is actually leading a, a project to put together a big project, then then they will know where to get certain specific things from in order to assemble them into the large project. And I think the large number of MSMEs who actually do things, um, the, the specific things very well, even with their limited resources, even with their limited manpower, but very skilled, specifically skilled manpower. There's somebody who does, I mean, we've, we've seen this in, 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 in many, many such projects where um, some of our companies in India have gotten so, um, so good at doing very specific things that they're sought world out after. I mean, it's not just in India. International projects, uh, scientific projects, and technical projects actually get Indian companies specific things, do, do, do specific things. And they, they acquire them from these small family-owned businesses and, 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 and small businesses. So I think that is, uh, I think, one of the ways to go. And all, all what we need is a very large number of them. And, and a very large number of, um, of, of um, such enterprises coming into the space sector. Thank you. Uh, the next question is coming from Rohit Mishra. Rohit, please go ahead. Uh, good evening. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. So uh, my question to Dr. Rai Chaudhary is, what should India do to stop possible human capital flight that is brain drain? In the space technology sector, as the demand for these homegrown scientists like IAS, TEP, RL, and LPCC will gradually grow because space pro demand for space program is going on, going like anything. Human capital flight to other countries, you mean? To retain yeah. them in India. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And I, 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 I think that is our biggest challenge now. If you look at... Um, if you look at the space sector now and you look at all these big um, success stories of Chandrayaan and Aditya, which we are celebrating, and you look at the people who are behind them, you will find um, almost a large overwhelming fraction of them are trained in smaller reg regional engineering colleges. Many of them are products of a, the earliest space MTech program in BIT Mesra in Ranchi. And uh, and they've been trained in in um, in small regional engineering colleges, and you'd find that the people who've gone to the really bigger, well-known engineering colleges in the country are working abroad. They're working not not just for um, other uh, space organizations, but they're working in industry and things like that. So that is why ISRO built, as you said, IAST in Chivandrum and PRL. Uh, to do the PRL's job is to produce scientists who can work on payloads, the scientific part of it, and and the the uh, organizations like the SAC and um, and ISIC and 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 IST are are also to to work on some of the space technologies. But you're absolutely right. What what stops their graduates from going abroad and not joining the ISRO um, um, uh, enterprise? And this is why again the private sector is needed. Now, ISRO has found that ISRO cannot employ all the graduates that come out of IST as it originally intended. 
um, because the number is and, and the quality of the students who come out of IST and, and, and such organizations is pretty high. And there are now several um, uh, colleges that are giving uh, education in space technologies. I mean, IIT Indore has been doing it for a long time. IIT Kanpur has started its own uh, own program and many of the IITs and engineering colleges are starting their space technology. Manipal has started. So these are um, these these will produce a very large number of trained engineers who can go into the space sector. And where will they work? We have to stop them from going abroad. And the way to do that is to have employment opportunities in the private sector, where not only will the number of uh, positions open up, but they will probably get salaries that uh, are comparable to the salaries they can get uh, in uh, um, and get abroad, which I think in the public sector is always difficult. Government organizations cannot match salaries that you get abroad. That is one. And I think the second thing is, you know, I mean, I, I've been looking at brain drain uh, for a long time. I mean, I'm, I myself worked abroad for close to 30 years and came back to India uh, to, to work here. And, uh, uh, and I've seen a lot of my friends um, do this. And I think it's getting increasingly difficult for Indian nationals, people who like uh, working uh, in India, who call themselves uh, Indian, to, um, to operate uh, all their lives in, uh, in, in a foreign environment. And there's a certain amount of pride that we have in working in India. There's a whole sense of building the Indian infrastructure. Um, we like Indian food. We like living here. We like Indian people around us. And so that kind of, um, that kind of consideration is getting more and more important in a, in a world that is very closely connected nowadays. It's, I, mean, I mean, when I was a student, it was a huge thing to be able to go to America. Now you can just, you know, there are people who are going for their honeymoon. They're just going on the weekend and coming back. So, the whole attraction of going to foreign lands is getting down and, and one needs to figure out where they want to work. And they want to work in a rewarding enterprise, which is now the growing space industry in India where the private players come in. The, it's not just one organization. And, uh, and, and we can grow to actually account for a very large fraction of what I was talking about, the, the global space industry it will be very rewarding. You see that already has happened in the software sector. You see a very large number of Indians as well as foreign scientists working in the software sector in India because it's a large enterprise. You go to these large software companies, there are 40, 50,000 people working there. And, and that is, they all work together. There's a culture of working together. There's a whole pattern set up of working together. And we can very proudly say that, you know, most of the software in the world is happening here. I want that to happen in the space industry. Right. Uh, the uh, next question is from Rishabh Aroda. Uh, Rishabh, please go ahead. Rishabh, are you there? Sir. Hi, sir. Am I, am I audible, sir? Yeah, yes, yeah, please. Uh, hi, sir. Good evening, sir. Sir, most of the uh, most of my issues have already been answered by Dr. Dr. A. Chaudhary. I just have a few more issues that I want to ask, sir. Sir, the my first query is that, sir, is there any possibility of SpaceX kind of enterprise in India in near future? And, sir, how how is this NSIL achieving its goal, the as as intended by the ISRO? And, sir, my next question is that, sir, as 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 of, as often times proclaimed by Mr. Mr. Elon Musk that mass colonization is his ultimate goal. Is it, sir, possible in near future, sir? <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I think I'm being heard by a lot of people, so I won't say anything <laughs> disparaging about Mr. Musk. But um, but I um, actually, SpaceX is a wonderful enterprise and uh, um, it has been led by the idiosyncrasies of an individual to some extent. And in that way, it is very unique. And to replicate something like that in India is not probably going to be the best um, way of going forward. On the other hand, um, you know, SpaceX and uh, related uh, projects have achieved an amazing number of things. Some of them annoy me because the Starlink uh, whole system is ruining astronomy. I'm an astronomer and I can't observe the sky with, without these satellites whizzing around in front of me. But it produces, on the other hand, 
a huge fleet of satellites that's adding to the GPS and, and global communication. So the kinds of stuff that SpaceX does, and, and then in the, in the private sector, it has now done launches that are that match NASA launches, that match ISRO launches. So that is amazing. And I would be very happy if a company like SpaceX forms in India, but it will probably not be um, led by somebody who is um, uh, guided by the same principles as Mr. Musk in terms of achievements. And probably I, I, I would recommend that it doesn't set the same goals and standards as Mr. Musk does. Um, talking about space tourism and, and, and colony in Mars, uh, it's not going to happen in the next few years. No, no. It's going to take a long time. And it take a long time because think of the amount of time it takes to go to Mars. And you have to, if, if you want to send humans and distances that will, in, in journeys that will last many years, then one has to work out how long um, humans can spend in space for that long period. Single missions that have gone to the moon, for example, have tested human endurance over days. The longest uh, he, human has spent in space in the space station has been a year or so. And here we're talking of much longer periods and you have to put them together in spacecraft and send them on missions that will last many years. So um, how are you going to get along with somebody in a cramped space and in a journey of many years together um, just the sociological aspect of it is mind-boggling. Even if you send people in pairs, maybe three or four, in a small spacecraft, and they have to be with each other in each other's nose for um, you know so many years together, that kind of experiments have not been done yet. So I'm not so sure Mars human mission to Mars is going to happen very soon. And even if it happens soon with single people, to actually spend, send large numbers of people um, out there is going to be taking time because we have to sort out a lot of issues. Should we just put them to sleep and wake them up there so that they don't you know, kill each other off or fight with each other the entire time? Things like that. And, and so that kind of issues are real issues. They're in science fiction, but these are real issues. So eventually I think it is uh, something that will be done because eventually we'll have to move into the other parts of the solar system if not to colonize them, but to uh, conduct experiments, do mining, do kind of scientific experiments. So people will have to go and set up colonies on Mars, first the moon and, and Mars, just like we've set up colonies on, on Antarctica and, and the Arctic Circle and things like that and in, in remote parts of the Earth. So that itself is not happening in the next decade. And again, it will happen in stages and stages and stages. We have to build up a lot of things. And here, not just the technological development is important. Far more important are sociological experiments, psychological experiments, biological experiments to figure out how a human body can endure such, such, a, such a condition. Thank you. Uh, those <laughs> very interesting. Actually, not uh, discussed very frequently. Uh, uh, but that that brings us to our last question. Uh, that's from Aditi. Aditi, if you are there, please go ahead. Uh, I'm afraid. Uh, I don't not. think. Uh, we can get our voice. Uh, but in any case, uh, I think we'll have to close it here. Uh, we are really running out of time now. Uh, thank you, everyone who joined in. Thank you, Dr. Sumak, for uh, your time, for patiently answering all your all the questions. Uh, and thank you, Plutus IS, for uh, you know your, your support for this uh, session. I'll just hand it over to Monojit now to close the session. Yeah, I mean, uh, Dr. Rai Chudri, I mean, amazing. I mean, you put so many things in context. You answered so many questions, provided such great perspective, and you drew such a wonderful big picture. And everything in such clear, accessible language that, you know, I mean, journalists can't avoid the cliches. You know, you actually made people believe that it's not rocket science, you know. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. it's, it's just so amazing. So thank you, sir, for educating us, for enlightening us. It was absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Amitabh, I, I, wonderful as always. I mean, we've done so many of these together and every time, you know, I'm impressed by how beautifully you hand them. 
Uh, thank you to everyone who logged on today. Uh, there are so many of you, and I see so many questions in the chat box still. My sincere yeah, unfortunately, we couldn't take up all of them, but some very interesting things, which I, yeah. I'll, I'll come back to you later. Some very yeah, interesting save, thoughts save in the chat those, box. Save the well. questions. I would be happy yeah, to yeah. see Yes. Okay. Oh, that's that's very kind of you. That's very kind of you. I mean, our apologies. I mean, this time is a constraint. I mean, uh, we are very thankful to Dr. Rai for so much time. Uh, but I do hope, uh, I mean, even if your question was not answered, I hope that you enjoyed the session. Uh, this video will be up very soon on the Indian Express YouTube channel for you to go back to, to like, to share, uh, to keep. Um, Finally, thank you to our partner, Plutus IS, as Amitabh said, sponsors, sponsors are very important. Uh, we'll stop here tonight. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rai Chaudhary, Amitabh, everyone else once again. Um, good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.